so if, if, if y'all, okay, here we go. Never mind, got a mic. All right, so to start us off, um, awareness leading to action was kind of the theme that I was given for this talk, and I, I love that theme because it actually aligns very directly with my own approach to this topic. But I really want, um, in particular, to talk about the impact that women are having on the sport industry today. So if you got a chance to sit in on the panel earlier, you heard a lot of um, the research that we have right now is talking about why and you know, what have been some of the barriers for the women who try to get into this industry. And I'll talk directly about some of those barriers as well as some of the actions that we can take um, to move move the, the bar forward or move uh, more women into the advancement in, in sport. But to start off, they always say the first thing you need to do is help people understand a little bit about who you are before you start telling the rest of the story. And so to give you a little bit of history, I was actually a Title IX baby. So what that means is Title IX came into effect about the time that I was wanting to become an athlete. And I had that opportunity in high school and even in college, so much so that I thought, oh, this is a really cool way to live your life, and I wanted to be a coach. My coach, I went to Adams State here in Colorado, was a cross-country and track athlete, which if you know anything about Adams State, her probably was a little different than what I was being told. So I have my mountain here, not just to be symbolic of Colorado, but really symbolic of the fact that there were a lot of there was a lot of summiting to do. There's a lot of mountains to climb, if in fact that was the career that I aspired to have. What I have here for you today um, is a talk that emerged out of that desire to become a coach and all the barriers that came into place and actually ultimately led me leaving the coaching profession. The model that I use is actually begins with awareness and ends with action, and in between, it's creating interest and desire. The ADA model comes out of marketing. I actually went from being a college athlete to being a college coach. It wasn't that easy, but during my time as a college coach, I learned directly about a little thing called gender equity. What I learned about it was that it wasn't happening. So at this period of time for women coaches and women athletes, if there was a budget cut, if there was something happening where we didn't have enough resources, the first thing to go was the women's program, and the first coaches to go were women coaches. So I found myself without a job at one point in time because they eliminated a number of women coaches and a number of women's programs. And I thought, this doesn't seem right to me. Why is it that all the men get to go unscathed, meanwhile they're cutting all the women's programs? This is when I began to learn about Title IX, and this is when I decided to pursue higher education, get my doctorate, and become an advocate for Title IX. And this model is one of those sorts of models that helps, helps us go from a very beginning place of awareness, just recognizing that there's something we need to know more about, to creating an interest in that kind of thing. I, I didn't know that I needed to know about Title IX. I didn't know that there was something out there that should have re been a remedy for the kind of discrimination that we were experiencing. That created in me the desire to create change so that those who came after me, those who did want to coach, those who do want to work in sport, have the opportunity. What can I do to affect that kind of change? And that leads to action. For today's talk, I'm going to use this model, the ADA model, awareness, interest, desire, and action, to talk about advancing women in sport. I'll start off with how women have evolved in the sport industry, so the awareness piece, and some of the challenges that women have faced. I'll move on to hopefully generating some interest among you all in understanding how women are now breaking new ground, as well as some of the benefits of diversity. Next, we'll talk about desire. There is a very real reason, not just a moral argument now, but a very real reason to advance women and others, you know, this whole diversity and inclusion piece, there's economic value to it, not just the moral and social value. And then I'll talk about action. What are some of the ideas from thought leaders? Oh, wow.
I guess slow it down there, and then we'll kind of come together and do some whole constructive knowledge. I really do believe that people have a lot to bring to the table, um, so I don't want to stand up here and lecture you guys for 15 minutes. So we're kind of going to get into some discussion about what this looks like. Um, I'm going to tell you what we're doing at CSU, and I really like to hear about what you know, what you don't know, what you're interested in. If there's something that said that sparked your interest, feel free to ask questions as I go. Um, this is going to be really interactive, so pay attention. I hope you really get some good things out of this. Um, so as a student athlete at Colorado State University, I learned a lot about my identity as it relates to being a black student athlete. Um, it was really through the ways in which um, my peers, coaches, staff, faculty perceived me through that identity that I came into this internal battle of, you know, what does it mean to be a student athlete? What does it mean to be a black student athlete? Um, what does it simply mean to be just me, right? Um, so in particular, there was this one instance where it was the beginning of our season, and so going into class with a travel letter. Uh, this travel letter gave my professor the time and dates uh, that I would be happy to excuse from class. So I walked into the classroom and I kind of felt like everyone was like looking at me and I was confused, maybe I was in the wrong room, this was my freshman year, so maybe I was just in the wrong space. I'm also first generation, so navigating campus was uh, new for me. Um, so I'm thinking maybe I'm in the wrong classroom, maybe you know, checking the time to make sure that I'm not late. And then it, it dawned on me as a black person in, in the space and I was wearing all team issue gear. So not only did they see that I was a student athlete, I was a black student athlete at that. So there was that assumption of, oh, you're here to just play a sport, and it's easy for you to be here, right? Um, so at the end of class, I go and talk to one of the professor and go to introduce myself, hand her this travel letter, and as I'm talking with her, she kind of cuts me off and says, oh, I know what this is. Um, I know this, I know what this is, and I know who you are as I've had many student athletes in my class before. And I was kind of stunned of her claim that she knew who I was. This was our first interaction with each other, and you're telling me you know who I am. You don't probably don't even know my name. So there was this kind of internal battle of how do I navigate this conversation for this entire semester. So I go and talk to my academic coordinator, um, and kind of wanted to process this experience that I was having. Maybe I just thinking too much into it, just really wanted to check it out, see what someone else had a similar experience. My academic coordinator tells me that Oh yeah, she's right, many student athletes do take that course. Um, and then it was in that moment that I realized, oh, I'm in the athlete major, right? There's a, yeah. So I am in the athlete major, right? And so I'm trying to figure out what does that mean? There's a lot of student athletes in this space. I just have this conversation with my, not only my professor, but my academic coordinator as well, who's telling me like, yeah, she's right. Don't think too much about it. You know, get your grades up, you'll be fine throughout the semester. And so now I'm processing this experience and I'm wondering, I'm questioning, what does it mean to be? Not as, even as a student athlete, I remove myself from being a student athlete. What does it mean to be me in this space, in higher education, um, at a predominantly white institution, and then adding on, what does it mean to be a black student athlete? So today I'm here to ask the question, why are all the student athletes sitting together in classrooms? But more so, what is it that we are doing to help student athletes find themselves? There was a, I think there was a gentleman earlier today who asked the question to Tamika Ketchings about, you know, after I'm done with my collegiate sport, how do I find that identity? Where do I learn or that transition out of being a student athlete? So what is it that we're doing to help student athletes find themselves, their whole selves, um, their interests, whatever they want to do? What are we doing in higher education, whether that be at the faculty level or just simply in athletics? <clears throat> so in my story, I talk about this moment where I found out I was an athlete major, right? What does that really mean? So scholars have termed that as academic clustering. Um, an ad academic clustering is said to be the grouping of uh, putting student athletes or systematically placing student athletes into one particular major um, or college, whether that be because the course material is easy or just simply works out with practice schedules. Now, is that really happening? Is it coincidence? Is, is Austin, are all student athletes interested in HES like I was? We don't know. We can't really say that for sure. But the other piece of this story is this piece of what does it mean to be me? My identity, right? A lot of us. Um, come to college or come into college as a space to figure that out, right? Um, so what does that say? What do we know about ourselves? So um, scholars like Dr. Beeman, Dr. Bimper, and Dr. Harrison kind of talk a lot about um, student athlete development, student athlete development identity, specifically in black student athletes. A lot of black student athletes see themselves as just student athletes by the time that they come into higher education. Um, some of that is because they've been doing it their whole lives. Um, I'll talk more about this later on down the line, but signing day has a lot to do with that perception of how they see themselves in relationship to other students on campus. So the other piece of this is identity foreclosure, um, which is uh, defined as identity foreclosure is defined as a commitment 
to an identity before one has meaningfully explored other options or engaged in exploring behaviors such as career exploration, talent development, or joining social interest groups or clubs. So some theory behind all of this. Um, so looking at racial identity models like an adolescence, um, that is a kind of five-step process of becoming or coming to an understanding of what it means to be black for that particular individual. And there's about five steps to that. Um, and then more importantly here in this model, um, by Crystal Navarro, Dr. Christine Navarro, who is now at the University of Wisconsin, I believe, um, kind of came up with this model. Can everyone see this? Okay. Uh, so came up with this model, but what's at the bottom of this model is what's most important, is identity. How can we do all of these other things and identify as um, black student athletes, which means one in four of our student athletes identify as black. That's just in athletics. So what happens when they go out onto main campus and they're sitting in those classrooms? They become the four percent of black student students on campus. So they are sitting in that classroom all alone. And so what we want to do is empower student athletes that when they walk on campus, when they walk into these classrooms, they feel like they're supposed to be there. They are engaged in the classroom. Um, they can wear their gear and say, I'm a student athlete and I'm here to do a lab. And I'm here to learn this subject and really master this subject and really take this away on maybe even onto the field, right? Or a field of play. So what's the impact of the black student athlete? <coughs> So I talked a little bit about um, National Signing Day earlier. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, so Colorado State has this kind of hashtag about the synopsis of it really is when student athletes get their acceptance letter. Um, so they take a picture of hashtag Colorado State Bound. And so if you go on Instagram or any social media outlet, you type in this hashtag and you see all of these students, right? What, what assumptions can we make about the students in this picture? White? Yeah. Female? Female? And most of these students are also in-state students. So, what do we know about our black student athletes when they come on campus? This is what we see. This is the first thing we see about these student athletes before they even step onto campus. I came to see issue. What this picture says is that I came to see issue to play this sport. We don't even know what their major is. You can see at the bottom kind of where they're from get a geographical location, but we don't really know much about their experience, their background, where they really come from. This is the first thing that we see. So what's interesting here is that this imagery that we put into the world is how they then become to see each other. So our black student athletes see other students and just, oh, they get to just be here, explore themselves, engage in all of these different things while I'm just here to play a sport. So they begin to see each other that way. So this imagery that we put out into the world also, what's the word I'm looking for? Connected to campus. And that second year um, is really focused on academics, um, picking a major, um, exploring all those options if you didn't come and decide it was a major. That third year is really focused on um, professional development. So we have our back passive briefcases, which is an, op an opportunity for student athletes to engage with other, pro other professionals on campus of being a student athlete, um, graduation, um, and what is next for that individual student athlete. So for this topic, I'm going to declare your future day. So declare your future day is an opportunity for us to pause and celebrate the academic journey and success of our student athletes. We don't get to do that a lot, right? We wait till graduation, hopefully that they, hoping that they get there. So for those of them that fall off or transfer or whatever that looks like, when do we pause and celebrate them? So before they come in to declare your future day, we do a few things. One of them is well, if they are already declared, we have them speak with career counselors on our campus and our career center that really help them to explore the major that they chose. So maybe they're in internship. Is graduate school necessary? Um, what can I do with this degree once I graduate? Having started to have those conversations and then those student athletes will come back to their academic coordinator and engage in an accountability, accountability plan. Um, so how can I hope to hold you accountable? accountable? Um, so for those student athletes who are undecided, um, we too have them talk to career counselors and do some inventory to check in to see what you're interested in. How can I help you connect to campus in a different way that maybe we're not thinking about? So on the day, does this look familiar? 
Single. Right, and there's National Assignment Day. So not only are we celebrating their um, achievements on their field of play and their sport, we're celebrating them in the classroom. So we have them sign a pledge um, that they create themselves. So one of them is accountability because that I, I created this, and then now I'm going to step up to the plate, right? Um, and so what's interesting, what I really love about this day is hearing what our student athletes have to say after the fact. So at CSU, we have our student athletes are represented in seven, seven of the eight colleges. Our largest college being liberal arts, um, which I think has about 25 majors, which is typical. Um, but here's what they have to say about each other. Oh, this is my teammate, but I didn't know that they were interested in this. Oh, this is my teammate, and I've never seen him dressed up. Oh, this is my teammate, and 